Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Acts chapter 10, verse 24 is where we begin our study today. So get your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 10. We'll begin in just a moment. Remember, the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Go there, choose, click, and listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible, verse by verse, going on five, all there for you. Almost 10,000, right around 10,000 messages. Um, I go back 38 years to when I started Scripture verse by verse. Four complete series going on five. It's all there for you at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. And now let's pray. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. 10.24. And the next, well, let's read beginning in verse 23. Then he called them in and lodged them, talking about Cornelius. And on the next day, Peter went away with them um, to go see Cornelius. Sorry. And certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him, accompanied Peter. And the next day they entered into Caesarea. And Cornelius waited for them. And he called together his kinsmen and near friends. This was a big deal for Cornelius. He was excited about Peter's arrival because Cornelius knew that God sent him and that he was about to receive the word of God from Peter. And he's excited. He can't wait. And those of us who have the word of God in our possession should be just as excited as Cornelius was. We should be just that excited to read it. Christians who love the Word of God, love being taught the Word of God, are no different than Cornelius. They're excited about receiving God's Word because it's God's Word, and they're content with it. They don't need entertainment. They don't need cuteness. They don't need intellectualism from their teachers. They just want the pure, simple Word of God. We should never take it for granted. And I don't think we do. I don't. And if you're a regular listener to God's Word with me, I don't think you're the type that take it for granted either because I know how much you love God and His Word. You would. You must. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Cornelius had a heart for God, but falling and worshiping Peter proved that Cornelius needed instruction. 26. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Pope is supposed to be the uh, descendant of Peter in the direct line of the first Pope, they say, Peter. He should be just as appalled, appalled as Peter when people bow before him and kiss his ring or call him Holy Father of all things. Good night. Church leaders who faithfully perform their duties of teaching God's word should be honored. They should be honored according to the Word of God, because of their job, because of the work that they do. But it is ridiculous and it is wrong to kneel before them. And don't tell me that kiss, kneeling down and before the Pope and kissing his ring is just giving him honor. No, you're out of your mind. You're kidding yourself. It's not just honor. It's ridiculous. And it's something that had Peter appalled.
It's wrong to put such a focus on a religious leader. I don't care who he is. The Bible says that God will not share his glory with anyone else. And Peter would not take it when Cornelius bowed before him. He would not take it. And neither will any true holy man of God. 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So Cornelius had a whole household. He had a whole house full of people there waiting for Peter to show up. 28. And he said unto them, You know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came unto you without questioning as soon as I was sent for. I ask, therefore, for what intent you have sent me. You know, going to the house of Cornelius was a huge deal for Peter. And it was a big step for him to take. Traditionally, touching, even touching things that belong to Gentiles, or certainly entering into the home of a Gentile, would make a Jew unclean, ceremonially. But God is stretching Peter's belief. He's changing him. Those days are over. And God is asking Peter to set aside his religious tradition that's no longer biblical. It was biblical in Old Testament days, but not anymore. Those days have passed. God has turned the page. And Peter said, God has shown me not to call any man common. Calling a man common means calling him second rate. And there are no second rate human beings because we are all, each and every one of us, oh, probably the 10th rate or 20th rate or 100th rate. We are all that way. We're all second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth rate human beings because we're all sinners. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God according to Scripture, and we all desperately need a Savior. That's our only hope. The big difference between a saved person and an unsaved person is that the saved person has accepted God's mercy and repented, and the unsaved has not. 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, your prayer is heard, and your alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call here Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner, by the seaside, who, when he comes, shall speak unto you. Immediately, therefore, I sent to you, and you have done well that you are come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded you of God? And the man that Cornelius speaks of that told him these things was an angel. Cornelius really didn't know what was going on. But he wasn't alone because Peter didn't know what was going on either. Almighty God used an angel to bring these two men together. God was working behind the scenes using an angel to bring these two men together who were both clueless as to why they were there or what was going on. You know, if we could only see into the spiritual realm, we would probably be amazed at all the angelic activity that's going on on our behalf. According to Hebrews chapter 1, it is happening. We don't see it. We don't recognize it most of the time. But it's happening. 
just like it happened here. 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. That's a big lesson that Peter learned through all this. God is no respecter of persons, meaning this, God is not partial on deciding who to love and who he will save from hell. Doesn't matter what kind of blood you got flowing through your veins, as long as it's red. God's love and his mercy are not confined to the Israelites or to anyone else. This is something that Peter needed to hear. 35. But in every nation, he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Salvation is always through Christ, and it is always by God's grace, without exception. It's always through faith in Jesus Christ. But God knows the hearts of those who would receive Christ if they could and if they had the opportunity because God knows what's going on inside of every person. The person who fears God, according to Peter, understands that he is accountable to God and as a result, he avoids all known sin and asks for forgiveness when he fails. He gets that. In other words, a person who fears God and lives up to the light that they have, and that person will receive more knowledge from God, I believe it just like Cornelius did, so that he can receive Christ and be saved through Jesus, because there's no other way. You can't be saved unless you hear about Jesus and receive Jesus. Jesus himself said, unless you believe in me, you will die in your sin. It is wrong to say, as Billy Graham and uh, Robert Schuller, the king of the Crystal Cathedral, said, oh, people are going to be coming from all over the world who never heard of Christ and they will be saved and they never heard of Jesus, but they're still going to be saved. Oh, what Bible you get that out of? I noticed when they said that, they didn't quote any Bible verses. Of course not. It was just, I think, I believe. Oh, okay. Makes no sense. Carries no weight. Contradicts scripture. Reject it flat out. I don't care what their names are. 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And this was good news. Peace with God is the best news that anybody in this world has ever received. The problem is it never makes the headlines. People really don't care. If Christians don't get that good news to the world, no one's going to hear it. And even the remnant won't be able to respond. 37. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, John the Baptist, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. In the previous verse, we see that Jesus is good, and here we see that he is Lord of all, meaning, meaning that he does whatever he wants. He's Lord of all. Thankfully, he's also good. He's good. That's why we don't have to worry about the fact that he can do whatever he wants to do. We should be glad that he's good. Jesus can do anything. He is Lord of all. He can do anything that he wants to do. But unlike all other absolute rulers, Jesus only does what is good. 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, 
Every single sermon recorded in the book of Acts that we have looked at so far included a message about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that confirms, that resurrection is a thing that confirms that everything Jesus said was true. Because if he ever would have told one lie, he never would have came back from the dead because he would have sinned, you see. So how do we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by him? How do we know that for sure? It's because Jesus also said that he was coming back from the dead on day three, and he did, to prove that everything else that he said was true. Jesus is the only religious leader who ever started any religion who ever came back from the dead physically, bodily. And that proved that everything he said was true, proved that he was perfectly holy and reliable. 41. It all, everything rises and falls on the resurrection, you know. And that's why that one fellow, he, he was pretty, I don't even know if he's alive yet. But this was like 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago now. He was a, an atheist, a sworn atheist. And he, he knew that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was pivotal when it came to atheism or Christianity. So he, very smart man, set out to prove that Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead. Here's an atheist who sets out to prove that Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead. By the time he got done, done doing all of his research, he had repented of his sin and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because he was absolutely sure that Jesus rose from the dead. And he wrote a book. It was called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And I'm sorry I can't remember the guy's name. Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Yes, sir. All the evidence is there. And Jesus is the only religious leader, the only one who ever started a religion who said he was going to come back from the dead physically and did. And even gave the timetable, three days, and he did. 41. Let's read 40 with it. Him God raised up the third day and showed him op openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Notice that it says, that they ate and drank with Jesus after he rose from the dead. So his resurrection body was physical. There is a movement in modern evangelicalism to water down the doctrine of the resurrection, to not take a stand for the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know why they do that? It started in the so-called evangelical Bible college, <coughs> excuse me, Bible colleges and seminary. You know why they watered down that truth? So that they could appeal to a broader base of professing Christians who don't take the word of God at face value. So they sell out Jesus Christ, the most pivotal doctrine in all of Christianity, in my opinion. That's a tough thing to say. But that's how important the resurrection is, because without that, you got nothing. Without the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, you got nothing. And without that, Jesus lied. And without that, all of his apostles who were witnesses lied. And yet these modern evangelicals sell it out for the sake of money. Filthy lucre, those dirty, rotten snakes. I wouldn't give a nickel to any of those ministries. Not a nickel. They're selling out Christ left and right. And that was that was several years ago when they that was probably twenty years ago. And uh, of course it's just exploded in all sorts of different ways, selling out Christ, watering down the truth. You tell me how a spirit can eat food with the apostles and drink food and drink wine or food or whatever it is or, or water with the apostles spirit can't do it spirit doesn't have a body 
But Jesus did it after he was raised. What else did he do? 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Notice, Jesus will judge those who are still alive when he returns, and he will judge those who he will raise when he returns. He will judge the living and the dead. 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sin. Jesus said the same thing. Unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins. And he says the same thing right here. And yet you have people, modern evangelicals, I've seen the surveys. It's either over 50% or close to 50% of modern evangelicals don't think that, that Christianity, Jesus, is the only religion that God respects and accepts. Pitiful, 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 pitiful. And I lay the blame at the feet of the preachers who water down truth, just like those people who reject the bodily, physically resurrection of Jesus Christ and have the, and have the nerve to call themselves Bible believers. Gutless wonders, cowards, greedy for money. Jesus, no wonder Jesus said you can't serve God and money because if you're going to serve money, you're going to water down the truth in order to be popular. To him, to Jesus, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall have remission of sins. And remission means pardon. Pardon. You know what a pardon is, right? A pardon is when the guy in charge, the president or the governor, issues a pardon to a guilty criminal. He doesn't say, well, I declare that this criminal is innocent. No. He just says, I pardon you. You're not going to be punished for your sin. That's us. That's you and I as Christians. We're not innocent. God never, ever tells us that we're innocent. We've just been pardoned through Jesus Christ. We receive a full and everlasting pardon. That's it. We're guilty as can be. But God pardons us through Christ. And with that, we'll stop. Study all of God's Word with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, and that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. If you would like to be a part of Scripture Verse by Verse, it's very easy. Pray for me and pray for God's Word. Do it right now while you're thinking about it. I know many of you do put a note on your refrigerator and on your bathroom mirror because I've heard from you, and I appreciate that. Please do that. So every time you see it, you'll be reminded to pray for Mike and pray for the Word of God. It makes all the difference in the world. Believe me, I'll make a deal with you. I'll keep getting out the Word of God without watering it down. I'll keep doing, I'll keep teaching the whole counsel of God, verse by verse, without compromising for a second. I'll do that, and you pray for God's Word and for me, okay? Because when we do that together, we do those two things together, as dynamite. That is spiritual dynamite that the Holy Spirit will really, really use. So let's do that. And also, please study God's Word with me because that's so important. We need to take in as much of God's Word as we can that feeds our spirit, that draws us closer to Christ, that increases our faith, that helps our priorities be in line with God. And helps us to tune in to the mind of Christ which is inside of us. So please study God's word with me. And when you take a break from studying, go to the front page, click the donate button, prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also makes you a big part of this ministry. Thank you. And thanks for studying with me. See you next time.